Hi guys and welcome back. Hope you had a great break. Sorry I can't be with you today, but I uh, want to give you a quick introduction to ballistics and then let you do some, uh, some practice with some ballistics uh, questions today. Thank you, Ms. Green, for filling in. So here we go. Take a look at this video. When a shooting occurs, firearm examiners can gather evidence to assist with solving the crime. Examiners can compare and match bullets. Firearm barrels are manufactured with grooves in the barrel which form lands or metal ridges between the grooves. Each barrel has unique marks called striations or striae which are caused by the manufacturing process or through use and corrosion of the barrel. These striations are transmitted to the bullet as it passes through the barrel. Each rifle barrel is unique even if made by the same manufacturer in the same product run. A firearms examiner can compare the unique characteristics of a rifle barrel to a bullet by firing test bullets from the suspected weapon and then comparing the evidence bullet to the test bullet. A comparison microscope is then used to more closely examine the striations on each bullet to see if there is a match. Determining the distance between the gun muzzle and the victim's clothing or skin may establish whether a shooting was an accident, in self-defense, a suicide, or a homicide. Powder and primer residue are projected when a weapon is fired. A shot at close range can leave residues of these materials around the wound and can also burn skin. A contact shot, when the weapon is held against the surface of the target, will not leave residues around the wound, but rather in the underlying tissues through which the bullet has passed. The powder residue produced can form many different patterns depending on the gun and ammunition. Examiners usually fire the suspected weapon to create test patterns which can then be compared to the patterns of the residue found on the victim. It is also helpful if examiners can determine that someone has fired a gun by testing for the presence of primer and powder residue, particularly on the suspected shooter's hands. There are several different methods for testing, which commonly test for trace metals or organic compounds found in the powder residue. However, finding the trace metals or compounds does not necessarily mean that the suspect has fired a gun, since handling a weapon or loading and unloading it may also account for the presence of gunshot residue. The absence of residue on a suspect's hands does not mean that he or she did not fire a gun. Having the serial number on a firearm allows an investigator to trace a weapon to the owner. Often the serial number has been filed off or a false number may have been stamped as a replacement. There are several techniques to restore obliterated serial numbers, including applying a suspension of magnetic particles, using an acid solution, or using ultrasonic vibration. For more information, please visit ncstl.org. Okay, so that is a really quick overview of what ballistics is about. Here's a definition of ballistics. Ballistics is the identification of fired bullets, cartridge cases, or other ammunition components as having been fired from a specific firearm. So that's the long definition of ballistics. Ballistics is mainly concerned, though, with just analyzing bullets and bullet impacts to determine the type and where the bullet came from. So let's talk about how you do that. First of all, firearms identification or ballistics is a branch of tool mark identification. Tool mark identification, if you don't remember, is a branch of forensic science. So keep that in mind, tool mark identification. Ballistics tool marks are unique to the weapon. In other words, every single gun that is ever made, it doesn't matter if, if it's from the same place or same manufacturer, the, the bullets that come from that particular gun are unique and that's what allows us to use ballistics to identify guns, specific guns, and also that doesn't change over time. Now you could change it by filing or, or, or affecting the rifling on the inside of a barrel, but it doesn't change on its own over time. It's like a fingerprint. It's going to stay the same for the life of the gun. So here's a big question. Is firearm identification an individual or class characteristic? Is it, is it individual evidence or class evidence? Take a minute to think about that and be careful before you answer. Firearm identification or ballistics is typically known as individual evidence if there are striations on the bullet that can identify a specific gun it came from. The problem with that is we don't always know who fired the gun. Just because we know that a gun is, is the exact one used in a crime and that gun is found in someone's house, that doesn't mean we know who fired the gun. We just know which gun, and so that, that taken into account, it's still known as individual evidence. 
So here are some things that get submitted to the forensic laboratory as ballistics evidence. The spent bullet, okay, the cartridge case, and if you don't know the difference in a cartridge and a bullet, we'll, we'll learn that in a minute. Also shotgun shells or shot from the shotguns can sometimes be ballistics evidence. There is a little piece of, that comes out of a shotgun shell with the shot called the wadding, and it's what holds it in place inside the shell, and it comes out the muzzle of a shotgun, and that little piece can help us identify, too, what kind of, of uh, shotgun was used. Live ammunition that might be left at a crime scene, and then clothing. Clothing may contain GSR, and technically the person's skin, the person's body, can, be, uh, can actually be ballistics evidence if it has GSR on it as well. Here's just a quick comparison chart, and we have one of these on a, a, a poster uh, similar to this on the wall of all the American gun calibers. But you can see the real variety of the different kinds of, of calibers of weapons, that, uh, of, of bullets, cartridges that are available out there. Here are the parts to, uh, to a, a cartridge, okay? First of all, there's the cartridge case, and that's the part that contains the powder. The bullet is the part that actually comes out of the gun. The cartridge case does not come out of the gun. And if you've never shot a gun, maybe you don't know that. But there is the gunpowder inside is, is just typical black gunpowder. But also there is a little thing called the primer. And the primer is the part of the cartridge case that has a, a substance in it that, that whenever it's compressed, it creates a spark or heat. And that's what the, the, the gun actually strikes to cause the cartridge to ignite an explosion to take place that fires the bullet out of the gun. Here's a comparison of some ballistics, uh, just, just some uh, bullets being fired into ballistics gel and photographed with a, with a high-speed camera. And you can see the different sizes and, and uh, the different kind of explosive force that, diff that, uh, that, that bullets carry with them. Notice that the one down at the bottom is only 10 millimeters, which is, is not as big as the 45 caliber, but it, it creates a, a huge explosive force because it's traveling at the fastest speed uh, compared to the others. And so that affects the, the, the force too. And also the kind of bullet affects the explosive force. And we'll talk some about that later too. Check out these videos. point of that is, is is just to show you the the incredible force that that uh, bullets carry with them and how easily they can kill someone uh, a 30 out six bullet fired uh, carries a, a killing range of about seven to eight miles in other words if you fired a, 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 a 30 out six a high powered long distance rifle from uh, right here at our school, uh, it could still kill someone if it struck them even almost almost to Denton from here. And so uh, very powerful and, and, and incredible, incredibly dangerous. And that's why I always tell people that, that uh, you, you, you have to be so careful when dealing with guns and uh, with people who are, are you know carrying guns just just something you can't make a mistake with here, here's some different kinds of bullets and the way they look after they've been fired and you can see that they they uh, turn into kind of a mushroom shaped thing and they're not the the pristine bullet that we sometimes see on tv on crime shows 
This is called rifling, and rifling is on the inside of a rifle barrel, and you can see the little lines. Those, that's called rifling. It's made up of grooves and lands, and here's a look down, in the, down the barrel of a rifle. You know that those are there to impart spin to the, to the uh, bullet so that it spins and it stays on course and it goes faster and is a lot more accurate. Uh, the lands are the raised part, the grooves are the lower part on the barrel. And what you have to keep in mind though is grooves and lands are reversed when we're talking about the bullet itself because when it travels through it's like a mirror image of the, of the barrel. And so on a bullet the groove is going to be the part that's actually standing out on the bullet. Here are a couple of other definitions you need to know. One is the bore. Bore is the interior of a rifle barrel. And caliber, that's the measure of how far across the bore it is, the, the diameter of it. And we, we usually talk use, put it in terms of hundreds of an inch. So a, a 22 caliber bore rifle or handgun means that it is 0.22 inches across. Okay, some guns, uh, especially the ones that are made outside the United States originally, they're measured in, in millimeters, in metric. And so the nine millimeter is a common gun at, at, in the, that we see in America now. So here are the terms rifling, that's the spiral grooves on the inside of the bore of a rifle. Grooves are the low lying portions, lands are the raised portions. But the lands and grooves are reversed on a bullet so that the grooves are the raised portion and the lands are the low-lying portion on a bullet. One of the problems with bullets and, and using them as evidence is they, when they come into the crime lab, a lot of them are really messed up and so they look like the bullet you see on the screen right here. They're, they're distorted or messed up. Sometimes even uh, small fragments can just, they can be really badly damaged. But sometimes they, even a small fragment can be used to identify the gun it came from. When a person fires a weapon, GSR or gunshot residue ends up being sprayed back toward the shooter. And you can see in, in the example down below the, the gun this guy is firing, the, the cloud of gunshot residue that's coming back onto his hands and onto his clothing. And so one of the things that a forensic scientist does sometimes is swab the hand or the clothing for the presence of GSR. One GSR test is called the grease test, and that is a chemical test that, that looks for the nitrates that are left over from the gunpowder itself. And then there's also a test uh, that, that tests for the presence of, of lead, trace amounts of lead around a bullet hole. We know that a lot of bullets have, have lead content or are made of lead. Here's an example of a, a, a gun, uh, a ballistics expert uh, looking at gunshots that were fired into a car to determine their trajectory path and gathering evidence uh, for, for, for the ballistics lab. Here's a crime scene, and if you look at these little, uh, little markers, they are color-coded for uh, cartridges from different shells. And I don't know what happened at this crime scene, but obviously, uh, obviously a lot of gunshots were fired because these are markers for where all the cartridges were located uh, at that scene. And so part of, part of ballistics is not just looking at the bullet, but it's looking at where the gun was fired and where it was fired from and using math just like we did with blood spatter evidence to determine, uh, to determine where the gunshots came from. Okay, so other than grooves and lands and striations, what other marks might identify what gun was used? Here's the answer. When you look at a cartridge, the firing pin makes a tiny mark at the, on, uh, right there on the primer core and that little mark can also be used, it, it creates microscopic striations too, and that, that mark can also be used sometimes to identify an individual gun using the cartridge instead of the bullet. So that can be an individual mark too. We talked about this shooting, I think, at one point this year, but uh, just a reminder, this was a great story. It just happened about three years ago. This guy decided that it would be a good idea to fire some shots at the White House. Here's a ballistics expert looking at the, uh, at the gunshot uh, holes, which it didn't actually go through the ballistics glass at the White House. 
but he's uh, using those holes to determine a trajectory line to find out where the bullets came from. They were able to determine where they came from. They came from a hotel room, uh, just uh, which was actually less than a mile away from the White House. They determined the room that they came from and went down and checked, and sure enough, the guy had signed into that room under his own name. They arrested him sitting at the shop uh, downstairs uh, having a sandwich, and uh, so he, that was a pretty easy case to solve. He's in prison, federal prison today. This is a very famous case called the Son of Sam, David Berkowitz. It's a case that, that uh, occurred back in the 70s in New York. And uh, this case was solved partially with ballistics. And here's a, a segment about how that case was solved using ballistics evidence. We know from ballistics uh, studies that uh, uh, the bullet fired out of a particular gun has very, very unique markings. The bullet from the Voskarichin case matched the one that killed Donna Loria. It came from a Charter Arms Bulldog gun, 44 caliber. The particular gun involved was designed for sky marshals. Three stolen airplanes and nearly 300 hostages. During the 70s, there was a rash of airplane hijackings and air marshals were put on flights all over the world. But they had to come up with a weapon that they could fire inside of an airplane and not cause the plane to go down. Detectives began a nationwide search for charter arms bulldog guns. We checked them nationwide. We went to printout, the printout is the printout of all the charter arms bulldogs. We checked every one of them that we could find. They found thousands of bulldogs across the country. Someone in New York had one and was using it regularly. The killer had attacked in two New York boroughs, the Bronx and Queens. Police investigated the survivors of the attacks for any hint of a pattern. Joanne Lomino was shot in the spine and was paralyzed from the waist down. Donna DeMasi and Jody Valenti would recover from their injuries. Carl DeNaro would also recover after a metal plate was installed to replace his shattered skull. All the victims were very young, and all except Carl were women. Carl had long hair, and he was in the passenger seat. Rosemary had short hair, and she was in the driver's seat. Was it possible that the shooter mistook Carl for a woman? Now, the Son of Sam killings uh, had, had New York City, uh, everyone was so frightened for a long period of time in the late 70s because he would just uh, come up behind a blonde young lady sitting in a car uh, at night and, and shoot, uh, uh, fire the weapon at her head. And as you saw, some of them survived. And of course, he ended up shooting one, uh, one guy with long blonde hair. So that's another reason to stick with the Liberty haircut in the future. But the Son of Sam killings were solved because he was using a really specific type of gun. And uh, you can imagine how hard that would have been before the time that all this was computerized because they had to go through all these records by hand of these, uh, of these certain kind of guns. And that, that, uh, it took a lot of time. And of course, now we have uh, databases that store all the records for guns and firearms. Do a good job on the labs today. We'll see you on Thursday.